welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined remotely by Kevin Graham. Kevin, how are you doing? Not too bad, Paul. How's yourself? I'm good. We've been avoiding the Zoom scenario, but um, today it's been a wee hurdle and that's why we're late, but we figured it out. It's not Zoom anyway, but you know, dialing in. I definitely, and it's mainly my fault that my wee two-year-old has to quarantine, so I've got no childcare, so that's why I'm sitting in my kitchen. But I do like the artwork over your yeah. left shoulder, Scream of Delica, one of the finest albums. I think we've spoken about the time we took Andrew Innes to Celtic Park to watch the Lazio game. I think we might have mentioned it, aye. <laughs> <laughs> A memorable night that was, in many ways. I know. Anyways, so you're here, Kevin, and you're you're isolating for what fourteen days? Fourteen days, and well, my, my, my two year old has to isolate for fourteen days. So, by proxy, I need to isolate for the fourteen days as well. I mean, this is this, this is this is where it gets weird. Eh? I mean, why they just can't kind of test me, my wife, and my daughter? Um, because when the Huff says that we're okay to go about, but a two year old can't social distance, can it? No, so he's I know. been climbing. He's been climbing across us for the last couple of days and that, and so it's. I'd rather not be selfish and put you at risk and other people at risk. Eh? So I may as well just sit in my kitchen and do this. No, but we were putting it through tests to make sure that the sound and the visual quality was good enough, Kevin. Because we've seen it even on the likes of Sky Sports, where you know Wi Fi is failing and the quality is no great. But we won't let COVID beat us, mate. We're going to keep the no, Axon Bulletin coming. And, um, you know, just over the last week or so, I've been talking about a predicted Celtic starting 11 against Rangers. We're going to open up this uh, show today with yourself, giving me what you think will be Celtic's starting lineup. It's extremely difficult at this precise moment in time because we don't know what's going to happen in the next five days. Uh, we've got the news this morning that El Hamed has decided to self-isolate himself as well and he'll be getting a COVID test uh, at some point today. So it's Barkas and Goals, um, Duffy, Julian and Ayer because it's looking like they're only three options that we've got as a, as a back three. Um, I'm going to go for Frank Paul. Because obviously I've got to say that El Hamed probably won't be available, uh, judging by what's going on just now. Um, I do reckon that we'll see Greg Taylor on the left. I don't know. I don't think Neil Lennon will risk uh, Laxo. In the middle, I think we'll actually see a, a four in the middle. I think we'll see Callum McGregor, Scott Brown. Cham and David Turnbull and Lee Griffiths up front. Interesting. I've changed my lineup a few times due to the issues we've had with COVID and people isolating Kevin very much like yourself, isolating over there in Stirling. But um, looking at your team, it's very similar to mine. Although I wouldn't have started with Taylor, I'm looking at Luxalt getting a start. On the on the left, throw him in there. I think he's fit. As far as I know, he's fit. Well, well, he played that bounce game on Friday, eh? and he has been on the bench for Milan eh, since the start of the season. So mm-hmm. you've, got, you've got to presume that he is fit. Um, I, I, I just seen over the last since Lennon's returned, since the coaching staff as well, they don't seem to take many risks. It seems to be gone are the days that Martin O'Neill would throw in people for a for a start, and um, when they hadn't trained fully with their teammates, and I, I just can't see Lennon taking the risk with Laxalt because I reckon it would be quite hard on Greg Taylor, truthfully, who's had two decent performances the last two times out, uh, especially the game against Hibs. This game against Rangers might suit him more because. Uh, they, they all play their usual European style and that might suit them because they might have uh, a bit more to do defensively. So I'm hope, uh, I'm not hoping, but I think Len- Lennon and the coaching staff will have Greg Taylor in that team. But then again, Greg Taylor's away with Scotland at this precise moment in time. 
So Scotland have got one game left on Wednesday night against the Czech Republic. He never played. He never played last night against uh, Slovakia. Cal McGregor came on last night for the last 15 minutes. So we need to wait and see how fit he returns. But at the moment, I would probably err on the side of Neil Lennon uh, playing Greg Taylor. When you look at throwing a new arrival into a, such a big game, Kevin, I think it's certainly got its pros and cons. I remember Tommy Burns talking about that, being able to throw a player into a, a massive game and sometimes they don't have time to get the usual nerves about the magnitude of the occasion. And I think when you're looking at like Salt, what, what does the Celtic Rangers game mean to him? You know, he wants to do well because it's his first game for Celtic, but he's not going to get caught up really in the occasion uh, that maybe a domestic player would. What kind of occasion is it going to be? It's an empty stadium. It's it's going to be one of the weirdest, probably the weirdest ever Celtic Rangers game in modern times. Uh, even weirder when the, the, away, the number of away fans have been cut because that just basically turns it into a home cauldron. Um, so there's going to be nobody there. There's going to be no emotional reaction. There's going to be... I think we've seen it in the last couple of weeks, especially down in England, with some of the results down in England. And I'll probably say it that we saw it uh, the other night there with Scotland playing Israel. There would be no way in the world Scotland would have played that defensively and negatively for 120 minutes if there was 50,000 Scotsmen there. No way would that have happened. So the games are becoming more and more just games of professional chess with no emotional reaction. So this guy is a decent football player. He's a decent technical football player. And if Lennon gives him two weeks to get a job, look, sends him tapes of the work that Port Rangers do on, on their right-hand side with Tavernier and Tech Kent, He'll learn his job, no problem, and he's got no distract, distractions of getting caught up in the occasion. Because let's not beat about the bush. This is not an occasion. This is just another game of football with all the beauty ripped, all the beauty ripped out of it. It's just a box ticking exercise at this precise moment in time. Um, I don't know if you've seen it this morning, but our, our, the friend of the pod um, is releasing his new film, The Three Kings. And there's a quote from, I forgot his name there. <laughs> uh, there's a quote in it, there's a Jock Steen quote in it, football without fans is nothing. And in this lead up to this game, I'm beginning to feel like that. This doesn't feel like it's a big occasion at all. Johnny Evans, that was that. That's, jo- that's Johnny, it. Johnny Owens. Johnny Owens, sorry. Sorry, Johnny, if you're watching. No, it's an interesting point you raise because I, I do have it on my agenda, Kevin. Johnny Owen hinted when he was on the podcast a couple of years ago now. It was, he heard. did hint, didn't he? If you, if you listen back, that he might have been working on something along these lines. Then we received a, an advanced copy of Leo Moynihan's book, and this is adapted from the book. So we kind of seen that one developing, and let's be honest, if someone's going to make a, a documentary about that subject, I think Johnny Owens, that, you know, a great man to do it. The research he had already put into the subject two years ago when he was on the podcast was frightening. He had a great knowledge of all three men. He gets it. He gets football fans. He gets the working class of football. I mean, the documentary, I Believe in Miracles, about Brian Clough and that Nottingham Forest side is one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. It's absolutely fantastic. It's great pace, great music, great visuals. And he really just captured the spirit of that Nottingham Forest side. And now, going back to that podcast, I've I've listened back to it maybe at the start of lockdown um, because I was going to do an article about it and you knew that he knew all three men. Oh, big time. He'd done the 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 research, Kevin, hadn't he? Aye, he knew knew everything about Steen. When he was there, when Steen passed away uh, at Cardiff that night. Yeah. So... I'm really, really looking forward to that. Was a wee surprise this morning when when I when I saw that popping up on the social media. What did he say? You've probably listened to it more recently than I. He said something like, "You'd be the first to know," something like that. Aye, we would be the first to know. <laughs> well, he never told us. We just saw the trailer today. <laughs> but we got the book. <laughs> yeah, we got, we did get the book, and we will be reviewing that book. I mean, you look at the three clubs. 
Man United, Liverpool and Celtic. They've all been built by great Scotsmen. And I think that's why, from people on the outside looking in, that's why Celtic, Liverpool and Man United seem to have a connection. I do think there is a connection there. I do think there's a connection supporters-wise as well. And that's all down to those three men, definitely. Johnny Owen was on the podcast because he's a friend of Edgar Summertime Jones, who came up fairly recently to do an acoustic session for us. It's just being edited and that's going to be released very shortly. Eight brand new songs from Edgar and he recorded them at a State of Mind Studios. It's all been filmed. It's been professionally edited. So he put me on to Johnny and obviously Johnny's fiance. Um, as good pals with Martin Compson. But prior to all that, Johnny was already a Celtic fan. He used to travel up with a Welsh Celtic supporters club back in the day, and he still has a real affinity with Celtic. And it was funny, he used to send me um, gifts of Effie Ambrose. <laughs> when, if Celtic were playing a big game and we scored a goal, Ambrose would be doing his front flip uh, routine on my phone courtesy of Johnny Owen so I'm looking forward to seeing the film I think it's coming out digitally in December uh, I'm sure oh, I need, need to double check I'm sure it's 11th of November right I'm sure it's oh, 16th yeah. of October it's in cinema is there, is there maybe a premiere event something along those lines yeah, like yeah I was just too taken aback with the with a with a trailer to actually notice the details to tell you the truth. <laughs> I know well, that before <laughs> before the film, we should do the uh, review we've been meaning to do about the book. But, right. We'll do the review on a Celtic state of mind, Kevin, between the two of us. Now at the top of the the show, I asked you to give me your Celtic starting. I love that. I know it's difficult because we're losing players fairly regularly. It's now very concerning. Lack salt. For me, before Taylor, the other one was, you've got Turnbull in there, I've got El Yunusi, just playing off with Griffiths. But interestingly, we've both started with Lee Griffiths after just 15 minutes of first-team football. I know he played in a bounce game against Motherwell. Are you looking at Griffiths, Kevin, as someone who can give us a good 60 minutes? You've got to. Um, the way that you're looking at it just now is... Eddie's not going to be available. Um, Roy's still coming back for international duty. And they've been overrun by the Rangers midfield the last couple of times. And Mm -hmm. I reckon because there's not 60,000 Celtic fans going mental for us to get the ball forward, that Lennon will go extremely cautious. Um, You've also got the, the scenario where the brains behind the Rangers operation, Michael Beale, has made it known to everybody that he doesn't need Neil Lennon and the coaching staff as coaches. So we could actually see Lennon pull a surprise here and try to stifle the game. And I think this is one of these games that both teams will settle for a point at this precise moment in time. I think both teams will settle for a point. But I can see Lennon maybe packing the midfield uh, just to what's happened previously and get a grip on the game in the middle of the park. Don't give the Rangers danger men, because they have got danger men now, and that's what we've got to appreciate. This is the best Rangers team for um, since 2012, 2008, since they went bust. This is, a, this is the best Rangers team, and this is a team that have proved to us over the last season or two that they can take us on a day. So we need to treat them with respect, I know there's probably going to be some people in the comments going, they're rubbish, they're rubbish. They're not rubbish. They can't get the results that they've got in Europe for being rubbish. And the lack of the crowd, I think, benefits them because they've proved to be bottle merchants when there's a crowd there. The longer that we go without a crowd, I reckon it'll benefit them and and it'll work against us. I really do think it'll work against us. One of the interesting things you said earlier, Kevin, was when I was speaking about picking Laxalt and having the consideration that a new player from elsewhere may not get caught up in the occasion, you were speaking about there being no occasion. Do you think it's simply an occasion due to the fans? Because I'm thinking about the actual personnel. I'm thinking about Scott Brown. I'm thinking of Neil Lennon. They will make it 
a bigger game than your run of the mill if there is such a thing, domestic match? You're probably right there that the, the, the preparation and the fire up before the game will be more important maybe as against Motherwell or Livingston or somebody like that. But what makes it the fuse for these occasions is the fans. It's that that's the fuse for these occasions, and the game might start off at a, at a pace. It might start off harder and faster than maybe and maybe the other games that we've seen this season. But then it might just peter out into another game of football between twenty-two guys who are very good at their jobs, and whoever's going to be best on the day is going to win the game. And I, I, I do think there's going to be something missing. Something missing on, on Saturday, and it's us, definitely, it's us. How are you going to be watching it in your new state of lockdown? Um, probably where I'm sitting just now, <laughs> on my laptop. Um, I mean, I can't even go up to my dad's and watch it, eh? so I'm a, I'm a bit... Even, I, I might have been, I probably would have been doing with you in the studio uh, anyway, and I, I was looking forward to that, so I'll probably just sit and watch it here and join in the pre-half time and the post-match stuff with yourself. Well, the thing is you can dial in. It's something we've avoided as far as we possibly can, Kevin, so that um, the sound and the audio, which are the same, and the visuals um, aren't affected because we want to keep it as good quality as possi- possible. But we are faced with these restrictions ourselves now. You would have normally been in the studio um, distanced, obviously, uh, over the two or two and a half metre table. But unfortunately, you can't today. But on Saturday, you can certainly dial in and we'll get your thoughts um, before, during, and after the game as well. Now, before we go any further, um, I want to give a big shout out to someone who's a Celtic season ticket holder, Liam McGrorty. Now, Liam is a long-time listener of a Celtic state of mind. He got in touch. His Twitter handle is at McGrorty67. And he's got a design studio. He's got a design studio which is up for a prestigious award, Kevin, called a Design Award, right? Which apparently is the Ballon d'Or for design. He oh. is the emerging inter- interior designer of the year. His studio is called Youth. He's a big Axon fan. He's a big Celtic fan. And today is the final day that Celtic fans can get behind him and to give Liam a vote. So visit his Twitter at McGrorty67. And we'll actually do a few tweets out of the Axon page so that he can get in there and vote. Because... When you get people behind you and things like this, Kevin, what can happen is a Celtic State of Mind won the award back in 2018 Best Football Podcast in the UK. We're up for another one this year. It will be a a remote event. It will be us zooming in from the studio in December. But I love to see fellow Celts doing well. So good luck to Liam and hopefully everybody can get behind him. Definitely. Uh, all the the number of thousands of watchers and listeners that we've got get behind Liam and I'll just make sure my, my wife doesn't see the Twitter handle and interior designers when I might end up that hanging on my shoulder might end up disappearing if an interior designer gets a lot in my kitchen or, or my house or something like that so <laughs> no, everybody vote for him it's great to see a fellow Tim doing well and the Ballon d'Or of interior design eh? <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> brilliant so what What's the latest, Kevin? What's the latest with El Hamid? He's not feeling well. He's self-isolating. But he isn't yet in the COVID list of players who will be missing. Not yet, eh? But it doesn't look good, does it? Just at this precise, at this moment in time, it doesn't look good. Um, I mean, Israel, they travelled back to Israel to play the Czech Republic last night. And it just seems to be the travelling just seems to be exasperating this. It seems to be spreading this. Players coming out the uh, the club bubble and an international bubble, mixing with other players, going on flights. It, it just seems to be absolutely horrendous. 
Somebody on the comments yesterday, uh, I can't remember who it was, but I'm sure he's maybe in there today, spoke about European football, how we wanted like the Europa League to continue. The Europa League's different from um, international football because the clubs are in a club bubble. They're travelling on private jets. They're, they're not leaving that bubble. You, in international football, they're mixing their players from other clubs. They could be getting commercial flights as well wherever, wherever, they're, at, wherever they're actually going. So it's a completely different scenario. El Hamed will be a loss. Having big uh, beat on were fantastic last Thursday night against Scotland. Um, and again, it, it, it gave a great performance on the left-hand side. He's one of those versatile players. And it wouldn't it be a great leap or the imagination to actually get to the point to thinking if he was fit, he might be playing right back because he's a big game player against our main challengers for the league title. And Lennon and the coaching staff may actually see him as a better option, defensive option as Franklin. But now that's likely to get taken away from us. Eh? Um, if, I don't think this is the last player that will that will be tested positive this week. I still think at the end of this week could be absolute chaos, not just at Celtic, but at other clubs as well, when players return back and get tested again. Um, I, I do fear for a lot of games this weekend, not just our own. I mean, I would play Rangers at my back with a reserve team and still expect to beat them. But it's, uh, th- th- there's going to be a knock-on effect for this international break. Well, I did mention that yesterday, Kevin, on the impromptu Sunday bulletin. Uh, we put out two bulletins over the weekend due to the fact that there was no Celtic games to discuss, but there was plenty of other aspects of the club um, where we were able to put out two broadcasts Saturday and Sunday. And I think that's spot on, Kevin. When these players come back to the respective domestic clubs, it's just going to create a, a real issue and you know you're looking at the Republic of Ireland squad for example seven uh, were affected by it one of those players thankfully so far uh, who hasn't shown any effects is Shane Duffy what was your thoughts on his comments in relation to his wages uh, just recently where he's come out to confirm that Celtic are actually paying all of his wages Wow, well, um, I didn't expect that. We all we all expected the deal to maybe be a fifty fifty deal, didn't we? Because we don't we didn't expect Celtic to pay his full wage. That means he's the highest paid player at the club. And that may cause friction in the dressing room, especially when you've got players looking for new contracts and um Looking at the wages down south as well, it was interesting to hear that Brian Christie was saying that he's not in a rush to sign a new deal either. Um, but I mean, it shows the ambition of the club. It shows that the club can go to those wages for what will be a short period of time, i.e. a year, to get the right player in. It shows that the club have pushed the boat out. It shows, and also our transfer dealings have shown that the club have pushed the boat out as well. I mean, there'd be nothing to stop Eddie chatting that door now and going, um, by the way, you're giving him 50 grand a week, go and give me 50 grand a week to stay uh, for the whole of the season. There's nothing, in, again, Celtic are, are, are likely to knock that back, but it's a, it's a, a, it's a sign of intent by the club if they are paying his whole wages. And it also maybe points to if Duffy does well for us and he wants to sign permanently, then he'll need to take a wage cut because he would be pay 50 grand a week for four years. That That's that's not part of the accounting strategy. It's, it's not part of the long-term plan, is it, Kevin? No, definitely not. See, when you're talking there about some of the players who are out on international duty, who are on vast wages being paid for by Celtic, it does beg this question. We've been talking about it for the best part of the week with regards to the players who are going out there and they're now at risk of coming back with positive tests and then missing games for their parent club who is paying their wages. And it would appear that there is nothing Celtic can do. Now, people were using the Salzburg example, but by all accounts, there was something in place. There was an agreement in place with the league, the FA and the authorities 
to allow the withdrawal should, for example, three players prove positive. But there's nothing in place. So Celtic can't recall any of our players from international duty. How disappointing is that? It is disappointing. It's disappointing for every club who have got players away on international duty this week, not just Celtic. Obviously, we're going to look at it through a Celtic point of view and we make no apologies of that, that Celtic should be withdrawing their players just because we've now, looks like we could have four players who have went away fit and healthy on international duty and now have came back. Well, I know Ryan Christie's just isolating, but it's, it's absolutely ridiculous that the club's especially at this time, uh, this unprecedented time, that we cannot withdraw our players. I mean, if they say that they're injured, then they couldn't play at the weekend either because there's a two-week, is it a week rule or a two-week rule? Somebody will keep me right there. Um, it's just, I understand why the competitive internationals are ongoing, but the amount of international friendlies that have been played over this last week has been absolutely ridiculous. Um, I I, I do not see the point of friendly games at this time. It's just an unnecessary risk for the players, for staff. It's it's a box-ticking exercise. It's a money-ticking exercise. I want Celtic to withdraw um, their players from international duty um, now because we are at risk of a game at the weekend not going ahead. Um, and that's quite hard to handle when it's not the club's fault. Oh, it certainly is. Now, Kevin, the the actual headline of the Celtic State Mind Bulletin today is the three biggest challenges for Celtic uh, in the upcoming Glasgow Derby. We've already mentioned the issues you've just discussed there in relation to COVID and the squad. Um, that we currently look at is four down. How many will we lose for the game? That's that's one of the biggest threats, the biggest challenges. The second one is the man in charge, the whistler, the man in black. What's your thoughts, John Beaton? Oh, it's just oh, it's typical Scottish football, isn't it? It's typical that Scottish football put... Uh, I maybe got a bit of sympathy for John Beaton here, and don't jump on me. He's getting put under immense pressure by a, the lack of backbone by the Scottish uh, football authorities be giving him this game. He's, I mean, it's uh, it's the biggest game in the Scottish football calendar, and already the pressure that he's under has been intensified because of what happened previously. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of something that it would be like. Uh, it would be like sending somebody to drive a car on the same bit of road that they've already crashed on, and say we're going to, but your car's got no brakes now, and see that corner that you've crashed on before, you're going to crash again. Eh? Um, John Beaton's in a no one situation, um, and as his bosses are. That was almost as good as Steve McLaren's dove analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but if you know what I mean it's not John Beaton's fault well it is John Beaton's fault because he went for a pint in that pub and um, he missed free sending off offences by Alfredo Morelos and he's just not a very good referee but it is not his fault that he's in charge of this game it's the Scottish Football Authority's fault that he's in charge of this game and it's ludicrous that he's in charge of this game and let's not beat about the bush it's ludicrous that Many of the referees are in charge of top flight games in Scotland. And we could look at it from a paranoid point of view, but let's look at it from a, a, an elite, talented point of view. There's a lack of decent referees in Scotland, bottom line, who make mistakes for everybody, make mistakes for every single team up and down the country because they are poor referees. They're poorly trained, poor, poorly educated Everything needs ripped up and started again. So I've got sympathy for John Beaton. So what, what happens if he gives us a penalty that's not a penalty? Then folk will go, you've put him under pressure that way. What happens if he gives a decision to Rangers? Oh, but he's, he, that's bias, pure bias. The guys are in a one situation. And, and I asked a question just and, last and, week there, Kevin. Sorry. Who would have been someone who 
you would be not confident. I don't think there's ever a confidence as such. But who should have been the man in charge? Oh, my knowledge of referees is not that great. Um, Kalina, <laughs> does he still <laughs> referee games? What about that guy for Luxembourg we got when the referee went on strike? Um, he, he was not a bad referee. I, I'm, um, but saying that, uh, I, I don't know if you watched the Scotland game last night. Did you see the referee for the Scotland game last night? I didn't I watch it, Kevin, I've got to admit. Oh, he was absolutely rank rotten. Absolutely rank rotten. So there's a problem with refereeing all over the world. He was absolutely terrible. And by the way, the reason I never watched it is because I've got an issue at the moment with international football and in that it shouldn't be happening. And all I would do is spend the entire time concerned that a Celtic player's going to get injured. Uh, for any Celtic players who ended up on the park. That's my biggest concern during international football. I can't sit back and enjoy it, Kevin, you know. And also I was catching up on uh, Gangs of London as well, so I had better things to watch. But i seen my namesake scored again, yes. uh, leaving it down to Dykes to score the goal. But um, he seems to be doing OK. He's doing, he's doing fine. He's a bit of a, what can you say, uh, unusual a specimen in international football, i.e. we knock the ball long him and feed off the scraps. Um, Stephen O'Donnell put in a fantastic ball for the goal uh, and the big fair play, the big fella took it well. Um, I, I do get what you're saying. You've always got your heart in your mouth when you're watching international football, when you know that your players are playing. I mean, the, one of the Slovakian players last night got a serious injury as well and he was taken off stretcher, moon boot on, and you're like, his club side must just be watching that going, oh, no, but oh, it's, international football has always been like this, and it, the bigger there is a bigger picture here, there's a whole, whole bigger picture about sport in this time, and a lot of box, a, bo a lot of box ticking exercises, and that's all it is. Even football getting played is a box ticking exercise. And it's just trying to introduce, for me, it's just trying to introduce some sort of normality into a world that's not normal at this precise moment in time. And people have got used to watching games without crowds. And that's no entertainment. Well, it is entertainment, but it's not what we see as what football should be. And we need to watch ourselves. We, we do need to watch ourselves that people will get used to just watching games on the telly and not getting back into the back into the stadiums. When you said earlier about the occasion, Kevin, and linking that and obviously to the great Jock Steen's words, which have been attributed to other managers fairly recently, but we know it was Jock Steen that said it. When you're looking at the game, Celtic against Rangers, there is inevitably more needle in that fixture than Celtic against anyone else or Rangers against anyone else. And that has boiled over in recent times. We've seen scraps, for want of a better word, um, some quite embarrassing, uh, you know, where Scott Brown was dragged into a situation and almost blamed for it. You've got the Ryan Kent hooking Bruni and various others, you know, you can go further back. Do you still think that will exist? I think it will because of the magnitude of the fixture. This is a title um, challenger that we're playing. And I also think that when you've got Neil Lennon in charge and Scott Brown as your online, your um, on-field rather, leader, there's always going to be a bit extra needle. I also think Celtic have got more composure. And when you're looking at the discipline or indiscipline of some of the Rangers players, it'll work in our favour. You could get to a point where that needle's there for maybe 50, 60 minutes. And depending on how the game's going, it, then it could dis disappear. And the game could peter out without that crowd, without that noise, without that intensity. The game could peter out. Then again, you could get one of these mad games where it's like a training game almost. Uh, when I watched Liverpool against Aston Villa the, the other week there, it's almost as if like Liverpool were like, oh, well, they've scored, we'll go up the park and try and score. And the game was like a game of ding-dong. Like, uh, if you ever watch teams training, and like they just go for it, and there's no there's no shape, there's no form in the game whatsoever, and it becomes one of these just bizarre games of football. 
it could end up like that, but it depends how they handle the lack of atmosphere. It depends how how fired up. I, I, two seasons ago, we got beat one nothing at Ibrox eh, on the twenty ninth of January. Absolutely terrible game, and the tone for that game was set by Scott Arfield eh, kicking Olivier and Cham, and the crowd went absolutely mental. That get the tone for that game was set. If somebody puts in a crunching challenge on Saturday, there's going to be no reaction apart from the players shouting. Um, there's, there's no going to be any... There's no there's no pantomime villains, there's no booing, there's no cheering, there's no... Say Celtic are going nothing down, and I hope it doesn't harm. Say Celtic are going nothing down with 20 minutes to go. You fully expect the Celtic fans to be roaring them on. That's not going to be there. It's going to be really, really strange. And it's very interesting how the 22 players or how many are going to handle it, definitely. And for the guys making their debut as well, it's going to be a really strange, like Barkas, Duffy. It's not going to, especially Shane Duffy. It's not going to be what he expected his first Celtic Rangers game to be. No, absolutely not, Kevin. Now, we've got loads of comments coming through via Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. For anyone who is watching on YouTube, please remember to subscribe. It is free and we're producing daily content uh, for your enjoyment. We're going to get to some of these comments in a few moments, but the headline does say the three biggest challenges for Celtic. First one is COVID. Second one is the officials. And the third one, of course, is the opponent. And like you said, You've shown respect by saying that they are a decent side compared to sides we have faced previously, maybe under Warburton and Kazinha. Um Yeah, they do have uh, players who I look at and think, well, he could be dangerous for Celtic. And, and I've said this over the last week as well, the two fullbacks uh, playing for Rangers, if they are fit, because I think there is a doubt over Barisic. Uh-huh. I don't know if there's been an update today. This is another reason, Kevin, that I would play with the offensive Frimpong and Laxalt because if Taylor is playing up against Tavernier and he doesn't nullify that challenge, Taylor might end up defending for the whole game. He may. Um, what are, this probably goes against my, my team selection, but Tavernier, for me, is Rangers' most dangerous player. Uh, him and Kent. But Tavernier is also their biggest weakness down that side. Mm -hmm. So what you might actually see, and Neil Lennon's done this a few times, is you'll see Carl McGregor, and Brendan Rodgers actually done it, you'll see Carl McGregor out on that left-hand side, predominantly out on that left-hand side to occupy Tavernier. I think you might see that. Ryan Kent as well, he seems to be loving justifying the price tag now um, that, that he got. And you just have to look at his goals and assists this season to say that he's a player on form. He is a player on form, and he has got the he has got the ability to hurt us. And he likes a goal against us, doesn't he? He seems to be one of those players that the Peter Lovencrans type who will always play well against you, always score a goal, always get an assist. And he's got one of those dislikable haircuts as well, which makes him a pantomime villain on, on these sort of occasions. I thought he'd just been watching PK Blinders. Now, let's get to some of the comments coming in. Stephen Forbes via YouTube. Despite the positive COVID cases and ludicrous appointment of referee John Beaton, Celtic will still triumph in the face of adversity because that's what serial winners and champions do. And IH Decorating, another regular Axom viewer and contributor. This is a huge test of the character of all at the club. Can't focus on who is missing, can only focus on those available. No fans and a poor ref only add to the challenge. What a victory this would be. Kevin, I've not asked you yet about your prediction for the actual game. You said you would, you said both teams would be happy maybe with a point. Do you reckon it's going to end in a draw? That's a, I'll just step back a wee minute there. That's an interesting point by IH Decorating uh, because, do remember, we were written off going into the first Celtic Rangers game last season at Ibrox, the amount of injuries that we had. Everybody was talking about it's Gerrard's time, he's going, to, he's going to beat Neil Lennon. We went to Ibrox that day, completely nullified them and won one nothing. So we often see that Celtic are better when their backs are against their wall. The manager is better when he's seen as the underdog. So 
that that's a really, really good point that we could use all our disadvantages to our advantage and get a, what would be a fantastic victory. Um, both teams would probably settle for a draw. If it's nothing each after 70 minutes, it wouldn't surprise me if it ends up nothing each at 90 minutes. But I reckon Celtic will one 2 on. 2 nothing Celtic. Lee Griffiths to open the scoring. Lee Griffiths to get both of them. <laughs> I look forward to that. Joe Porter, I expect more positive COVID results to burn through football post-internationals. And Francie Dell, sorry, Dub LU, just got to accept the hurdles put in front of us and go out and give it our best. Nothing else we can do. It is what it is. Crazy times. Even with the players mentioned and quoted as being missing, the team that I'm going for, Kevin, is a very strong team. You've got Barkas mm-hmm. and goals, Julien Duffy and Ayer. I definitely would have considered El Hamid for Julien simply because I think he's good back up to Frimpong on the right with his offensive play. Obviously, Frimpong playing on the right, uh, giving the debut to Lazalt. Uh, Brown and McGregor in the engine room with Cham in front of them and Griffiths and El Yunusi. El Yunusi is the one with the question mark, I've got to admit. But I don't think this is a game for the likes of Turnbull to make it what would be his only his second start for Thank Celtic. Um, and Rogic, who's not played enough football, who else could play in that position? So I would go with El Yunusi. I'm quite happy with Turnbull there because he knows Scottish football, knows the Scottish game. I don't think it's a gamble playing Turnbull there. Uh, I'm maybe being overcautious um, with trying to read what Neil Lennon will do, but I do reckon he'll try and swamp the midfield and we could get quite a cagey, uh, sticky game in the middle of the park where nothing much happens and both teams will just wait until... They get that opportunity and hopefully they'll take it. And hopefully it'll be us that takes it. I mean, how, how good would it be if Lee Griffiths did score the winner? Did score. It'll be fantastic after I've written them off. The Rangers fans have been, some Rangers fans, not all Rangers fans, have been singing songs about them not playing football anymore and writing them off time and time again. Oh, the, the meltdown would be superb. It no, it would game. be, but... You know, we had that discussion, Kevin, a few times this season about Lee Griffiths. And as we were discussing it, Lee Griffiths tuned into the broadcast. You couldn't see the screen and you were giving him dog's abuse. <laughs> oh, he, 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 look, I, I don't think it was dog's abuse I was giving him. I was just, I, I, I was just relaying the facts as I saw them at that point. Um, he went out and scored the following week. Well, that's fine. And, and I said this last Monday. If he, if he wants my address, I'll gladly give him his ad- my address and he can come round and speak to me. I'm, no, I'm, I'm, sure, happy, I'm sure it'll be fine, Kevin. I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. Happy, I'm quite happy to, to get proven wrong. I'm quite happy to put my neck on the line and be proven wrong. That's fine. That's Kevin, when you give your opinion on a live broadcast, which is now going out, in actual fact, to up to 400,000 a month, People are going to disagree with you, no matter what you say. I know, definitely. But hey, I've, I've, I've got the I've got the worries about people um, sending back, casting up my wild opinions and uh, takes on stuff when they go wrong. Because usually, if they go wrong, that means that Celtic have won, and I'll be happy with that. I will yeah. be happy with that. We're giving opinions every single day, Kevin. Some of them are going to be incorrect. Stephen Kelly on YouTube, welcome to the show. Celtic have to mark Kent out the game and let them make a mistake, then hit them. I'm going for the bombing it down the right and left to nullify their two fullbacks. I think that's going to be key to winning the battle. Now, I know your point about the midfield, Kevin. The games have been lost and won in the midfield um, over the last few occasions. And I think... Remember the image that was released of the whiteboard that was left in the away dressing room at Celtic Park. Gerard knew that before he could handle the Celtic midfield, he knew that's what he had to do. Mm-hmm. But Celtic continued to over overrun them. But recently, I think Gerard has done pretty well in terms of his uh, tactics and, and the shape of his Rangers side against us. But what I continue to go back to is: Do we have the better squad? Do we have the better manager? 
do we have the better starting eleven? I think we do. I think we do. I, I don't think there's a question. If if any, if any Celtic fans out there out there is questioning that, then I think you're maybe in the wrong game. Um, of course, we've got the better squad. Of course, we've got the better manager, the, the more decorated manager, as a manager, not as a player, but as a manager. Um, I, I'm really, really interested at this take where Michael Beale says that there's nothing that Neil Lennon and John Kennedy that can do that can surprise him. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Neil Lennon, John Kennedy and Gavin Stratton can do to surprise the Rangers coaching staff. Because we did get overrun on that last game on the 29th of January. We got overrun in the League Cup final. So Celtic will need to... That's how I reckon we'll go for an extra body in the middle of the park. But that's just me being simple. That's that's me having a look at it with, with no coaching experience whatsoever. I'll leave, I'll leave that to the professionals. I'll leave that to the guys who have forgot more about football than I know about football. Don't put yourself down now, Kevin. The reason I was asking these fundamental questions, do Celtic have the better squad starting 11 management team, is because I think, yes, 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 we've got a treble on that. You take away the home advantage in terms of the support, you take away the atmosphere and the occasion, as you called it earlier on, Kevin, and then it's 11 v 11. Celtic have the better players in all departments. I mean, the players we've been speaking about in our opponent's team are handy players. They can Mm -hmm. uh, damage Celtic if given the opportunity. But I think that the occasion itself is going to be unusual and it will just come down to who's best. We won't be in a situation, I hope, where we have half a dozen players off form. That's the only way that Celtic would lose that game. Definitely. Um, I should actually stop saying definitely, but you would, you would presume that if, 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 our, if our first 11 are on their game, if, if our 11 are on our game, then we should win the game. That, that, that goes without saying. But you've got to just have a look at the last two times that we've played Rangers. And the problem that we've had is they've been better than us. And this is how we, we have to focus on this game. And this is how the coaching staff will be focusing on this game. You're playing a Rangers team who have clicked since the start of, since the start of the season. They are scoring goals. They seem to be more free, free flowing than what Celtic are. And they probably maybe going to the game as slight favourites in the in the eyes of the mainstream media. Um, not on this not on this media channel. They don't go into the game as favourites, but. We go into the game as doing what Celtic do. That there's no, that there's no glory about us. There's no hype about us. We're just doing what Celtic have done in the last four or five years, which is win games of football, get into the Europa League group stages, and showing character and that winning mentality. And that's something that our rivals haven't shown yet. It's all right winning games. You lost a cup final. It's all right winning a game in December, but when push came to shove, you bottled it. When, well, but when you had the chance to go and chase us, chase us, you bottled it. We didn't. So bring it on. I still, I still think that uh, weakness in our opponents is there. And I, I, as I says, it's got to be completely different without a crowd. How they react, how the players react, really, really interesting. It certainly will be. And uh, Kaplow Mark agrees this will show the real character of the players on Saturday. We've seen the character of the Celtic squad over a number of seasons need to show self-motivation because they won't have the fans behind them. So it is going to be a very unusual situation to, to watch unfold. Gary Doonan is getting involved via Facebook. When was the last time Celtic lost two league games in a row at Celtic Park to Rangers and any guys... 96, 97 in the Tommy Burns era? Must have been. I was probably at bay for them. <laughs> Whenever they were. Um, but this is, you're talking about self-motivation in the Celtic team there. Well, look at the self-motivation at uh, McDermott Park the last mm-hmm. time out. The self-motivation to get that winner. That mentality is there. 
that mentality is there. It's just how the game plays out is going to be a massive factor on the motivation of the players as it goes along. Joe Porter agrees with you, Kevin, and she is looking forward to a 2 0 win for Celtic. These games, I do feel, are difficult. They're difficult to predict. Uh, we don't have the, the usual um, atmosphere of the game, which is a massive factor, not only with the players and, and motivating the players and pushing them on, but it can be a massive factor in the decisions of referees. Uh, as well. Tony Hutton reckons we've got enough depth in our squad to deal with them. I totally agree with you. I'm going to start getting worried if we've got six or seven players missing though, Kevin, because they're all first teamers. The team that you've named, the team that I've named, every one of those 11 would get into any other team in Scotland. So we have got we have got the depth and we have got the strength to handle anything that's thrown at us. But as you say, once you start getting to six, seven or eight, then it's it's open, open to question then. Um, so we just need to hope that nobody else disappears before Saturday. Now, Tommy Burns got a mention here from Gary Doonan. It's always great to talk about the late, great Tommy. And I do remember when we were preparing to play Airdrie, in the 1995 Scottish Cup final, Kevin, after the game, Tommy said that he almost started Paul Byrne, who hadn't been in the team for weeks and possibly months, due to the fact that you can throw a player in, the expectations sometimes aren't as high, and they don't have the time to start getting the pre-match nerves and allow that to infiltrate their thought process. And Burns was very close to throwing in Paul Byrne against Airdrie that day. It would have been an interesting one. And I think it's the same train of thought with Lux Salt. You know, put him into that game. Would it be any different for him to any other game that he, that he plays for Celtic? It's an, it's an interesting... Um, uh, Another interesting angle on the Laxall question. Um, the reason being, we, we talk about Tavernier. Tavernier has never seen Laxall play. So it's a complete and utterly... Unknown quantity. Canvas. Unknown quantity for Tavernier to try and handle. Of course, you'll probably be watching videos of him at AC Milan, but he's, he won't have seen him what he's done recently. So he's going, he's going to actually try to have a look at videos from a few years back. Uh, so you could have that. That's an uh, unknown quantity. Look, he's a Uruguayan in international. He's played for AC Milan. He's played in World Cups. Playing against Rangers at an empty Celtic Park won't phase him whatsoever. Um, he's a Uruguayan. And the, let, let, let's uh, allow me to wall on a bit of stereotype here about Uruguayans. Uh, Uruguayans have got a want to win and they'll win at any costs and they're as hard as nails um, and as I've, I'm sure uh, Diego Laxall would handle the occasion no problem whatsoever if he was thrown in but that's that's a decision that the coaching staff will be like dwelling over today, tomorrow the next day They'll have a look. Well, they'll have a look at him at that bounce game last week, and if if they've got no qualms about his temperament, his mentality, that he's settled in well, it wouldn't surprise me if you see him playing. But my my gut instinct is we'll see Taylor on the left. Would you be more surprised if he was to play the fittest striker we have at Celtic Park at the moment, which is undoubtedly Clamalla? due to Edward's illness, a Yeti's injury, and Griffiths' lack of game time. Klamala would be the most fit striker we have. Would it surprise you if we started with Klamala just to do the running for 60 minutes before introducing maybe Lee Griffiths? It would, because, again, Neil seems to sometimes play players that he trusts more than players that are the benefit to the team. Um, we've seen that on a couple of occasions. Um, so it would surprise me that if he would put that pressure on Patrick Kamala. But he knows that Lee Griffiths can handle it. 
he knows that Lee Griffiths has been there, seen it, done it. And I don't think it's a risk playing Lee Griffiths for 60 minutes. Well, that'll be very interesting. And uh, obviously we'll be covering this game all week, Kevin. Hopefully you can join us for some of the pre-match preparation bulletins on Friday and then for the actual live match day material that we'll be putting out on the Saturday. It will be remote. You'll be doing it from your kitchen table. Uh, That's where it all started, from the kitchen table, Kevin. And uh, we've had some brilliant comments and questions coming in through the social media channel. So thank you all for getting involved. And all that's left for me to say today is thanks to Kevin Graham for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Thanks very much, lads. 